Over the last five or six days, the Holy Spirit has really been drawing me to Revelation chapter 2, to the letter to the church in Pergamum. That's what we're going to talk about in today's video. But y'all, we are living in the end times. We're living in the last days. I know some would disagree with me, but what I mean by that, that's not just my opinion, but biblically, that is the time period we are living in. The end times are a time period, and they started when Jesus ascended, when he came, died, and ascended back in to heaven, that started the end of the age or the time of God's rule, the kingdom of God that is here, but not yet. It's here already, but not yet. We've talked about it in some previous videos, but we are in the last days and Jesus is coming back soon. And these are not my own words. This is not my own opinion, but it's literally how the Bible ends. He ends it saying it three different times in just a few passages. And behold, I am coming soon in verse seven. In verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming soon. And in verse 20, he says, Surely I am coming soon. We know as we read scripture, we read the book of Revelation, that persecution and suffering is going to increase for those that are his, for the body of Christ, for the church. It's going to get harder and harder to be a Christian in this world world. Compromise is going to rise. Deception is going to rise. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 24 about this great falling away, the great apostasy. Paul talks about how many are going to fall away from the faith and submit to doctrines of demons. They're going to seek out teachers for themselves. It's all over the Bible if we pay attention to it. But when we look at the church in Pergamum, there's something that jumped out at me that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us and is drawing us to this text right now. This is not a thus saith the Lord or you know a prophecy to Adam, but this is what the Lord is speaking through his word. And I believe it's something that he wants us to pay attention to. If we look starting in verse 12, he says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So I want to stop right here, where Satan's throne is and where Satan dwells. Now, because Satan is not omnipresent, many believe Jesus literally means this is where Satan lives. This is where Satan's actual throne is, which some will say is the altar of Zeus. I'll put some photos on the screen for you. It kind of looks like a giant armchair if you look at it. It was high up on this mountain, and there were so many different temples here. This was a very, very dark and demonic place. This was a very sensual place, and it was riddled with sexual immorality and idolatry. The altar of Zeus, you know, Zeus was supposed to be the, the king of kings of all the gods, right? He had all power. So you could go see Zeus if you had some issues and you wanted to pray to Zeus and ask for his help. Or if you wanted to party and get drunk and, you know, participate in orgies, you would go to the temple of Dionysus and worship there. That's what they called this. They called this worship. Or if you, you know, wanted to make sure you were provided for for, and you had food and crops and all that, you would go to the temple of Demeter and you would pray and worship there. But the main attraction here in Pergamum was the temple of Asclepion, which was the god of healing. They were known to be more advanced in their healing practices, which they believed was in the power of snakes, believe it or not. If you went to this temple, you would be put in a trance. And what they would do is they would get a vision of what was wrong with you. And they would use that information from that vision to treat you. They even had a practice where they would put people in trances, put them in this dark room and allow the snakes to crawl over you and believed that this healed people. Ugh, gross, but so demonic. This is what they did, and people would come from all over the region to participate in this demonic practice. Or maybe you needed wisdom. You would go to the temple of Athena and pray and worship there and ask for wisdom. Or the temple of Trajan, where you would worship Caesar there because the emperors believed they were gods and the people were required to worship them like gods. This was a wicked, wicked, dark place. And there was this small little sect of people there called 
Christians. They believed in Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus was the king of kings rather than Zeus. They believed that Jesus was the one that gives us all pleasure and joy and peace. They didn't need to go to Dionysus, the god of wine and revelry. You know, they believe that Jesus is provider. We don't need to go to Demeter for crops and food. Jesus was the healer. He is the one who brings healing in our lives. Jesus is the source of all wisdom and knowledge, right? Jesus is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the all in all. So the Christians found themselves isolated from all of these different practices. We can't even imagine what it was like to live in such a dark place, such a wicked place, and be a follower of Jesus in this wicked, sexual, sensual, idolatrous environment. They were surrounded by it. It was nearly impossible to live and not be involved in these things in some way or another, yet they were doing it. It was fascinating, but it started to get the attention of the rulers and of the leadership of Pergamum. And Antipas was martyred for the faith, for being a faithful witness. And this made the people afraid. This is where the persecution started to increase. But Jesus said, even still, you hold fast to my name and you do not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you were Satan dwells. So they held fast to the name of Jesus. But over time, they began to grow weary. They began to get tired of the persecution and of the suffering. And they started to compromise and say, well, maybe I'll go to the temple, you know, one day a week just to get them off my back. You know, and then maybe that led to, well, I'll eat some of the food sacrificed to idols just so I look like I fit in and they won't, you know, mock me. They won't revile me. They won't persecute me. And then that leads to sexual immorality. One thing leads to another. And before long, many of them had begun to compromise, whether that was their initial intention or not, probably not. But the goal was to get the persecution and the suffering off of their back. And Jesus says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And this is the idea that they could do these things and hold fast to the name of Jesus. There was compromise, but Jesus says, therefore, repent. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to me through this passage passage. And I think about a culture of people and a church in compromise. These people had it so difficult. You know, my first reaction, my initial reaction is, man, they deserve a gold star for living in the midst of all of that and still holding fast to the name of Jesus. There was martyrs for the faith, something we don't understand here and now today, especially in America and the church of the West. Some other places, they do understand this way more than we do, but yet they still held on to the name of Jesus. But when I think about this, Jesus still says, repent, because he's not a God of compromise. He is jealous for you. He's jealous for me. See, they lived in a time where they didn't care that they served Jesus. They didn't care that they served Jesus Christ. But what they cared about is that they didn't also participate in worshiping the emperor and worshiping the many gods. They were polytheistic. If you want to add Jesus to the collection, sure. But the moment you say Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, okay, now we have a problem. When you want to stand up for Christ and Christ alone, now we have a problem. And I think some of you are starting to connect the dots of where the Lord has been leading me with this. But being a Christian is going to become more problematic. But it's okay to be a Christian as long as you're fine with the Muslims, as long as you're fine with the Buddhists, as long as you're fine with the New Age people, as long as you're fine with you know transgender story hour, as long as you're fine with abortion and all these things, and you're one of those cool Christians, you know, one of the Christians that that believe in God and believe in the Bible, but you also believe love is love and you believe that everybody can get along and you know, all, you know, there's multiple ways to God. This is just the way that I choose. As long as you're one of those believers, 
you're going to be just fine. But the persecution that's coming to our country, that's coming to the Church of the West, that already exists in other parts of the world, are for those that hold fast to His name and do not compromise. This was the warning. The therefore repent came because the people began to compromise. They were holding on to Jesus, but I'll just participate in this so that they don't make fun of me so that they don't mock me. Remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned us about this. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake, when they revile and mock you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. Guys, that day is upon us. That day is coming. You can believe me or not, but this is how the book ends. This is where this is all headed until everyone has to make a choice. Who will you serve? Which mark are you going to take? Are you going to be under the seal of God? Are you going to take the mark of the beast? Revelation 14, he describes the ones that are his by saying they are those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. They're obedient. They abide in him. They abide in his word. They do not compromise. They are consecrated. They have eyes for him and him alone. They stand up for truth and what is right according to what the word of God says. They don't care about what everybody else says. They don't compromise for money or for fame or for influence or for pleasure or whatever it may be. But they say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Not your kingdom come so my will can be done. These are the ones that are his. But we're entering the period on the timeline where if you're a true believer in Christ that stands up for the Bible and what the Bible says, The suffering, the mocking, the persecution, the reviling is about to start increasing on a whole new level. This is what the Lord is pointing me to. This is what the church of Pergamum did. This is what the church in Sardis was doing in the Jewish synagogues because Christianity was considered a sect of Judaism in that time. In their temples, they had little statues and little trinkets set up to the different Greek gods to say, we can all coexist. It would be like walking in your sanctuary today and seeing a little Buddha and a little Muhammad and little statues of other gods as we worship Jesus. I hope you are seeing and understanding the parallels between the Church of Pergamum and our nation and the Church of the West today. Look at what's happening with the Methodist Church. Look at this minister falling to sexual sin and that minister falling to sin and all these different things happening and all of the different compromise. The Push towards universalism where there's many ways to heaven now many gods it doesn't matter just choose your one and keep it to yourself whatever you choose great but don't tell me who to worship don't tell me Jesus is the only way the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but by him that is offensive if you want to worship Jesus on your own go ahead but don't tell me how to live my life that push towards universalism. Can't we all just get along? Can't we all just coexist? Do you see it? So my friend, I want to invite you to pray over the body of Christ. Pray for the people that are His, that we would not be ones of compromise, that we would be that city on a hill, that light in the darkness, that salt of the earth. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams it's good news we win we win in the end and the Lord has a plan for you and he has a plan for me and we have a role in this whole thing let's not just sit back and be spectators and talk about how bad things are becoming but let's get on our knees and start praying and interceding for those that are his that we would overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony that we would tell people about the gospel tell people about the one true God that we would tell people about Jesus and what he did on the cross and that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. Amen. The Holy Spirit has just been pouring this into me and it's been burdening my heart. So would you please, my friend, join me in this intercessory prayer 
for the body of Christ. If you want to partner with Glasshouse TV and what we are doing on a monthly basis, you can head over to our Patreon page and sign up there. I will put the link to it in the description below. But if you're not subscribed to the channel, I would genuinely appreciate it and ask you to hit the like button. That's the thumbs up button and that tells YouTube and the algorithm and all that to send this video out to more people so that they can hear this very important message. But thank you so much for being here and watching this video today, and I will see you in the next one.